Okie dokie artichokey. What's up, bodhisattvas? And bodhinatvas. I've been saving that one for you. Bodhisattvas and bodhinatvas. We have a boiling pot of a topic for you today. It comes by way of a friend of mine. We shall call her Jane. Jane lives in New York. She doesn't like to have her name mentioned anywhere on the internet, so I shall be disguising her identity. She sent me a very interesting email. Let's read this letter that this friend sent me, and then we're gonna unpack this issue a little bit. She says, so I went to a monthly meditation thing at a yoga studio in town. And I swear it felt kind of culty. The lady running the session starts by doing the hobby, um, the hobby that people like her do in situations like this, which is um, saying that we're on the land of the following indigenous tribes. Um, my friend goes on to say, I can say this because my great grandmother was one of the indigenous peoples. And then my friend says, okay, maybe this is okay. Then she says, we should go around and say our first names and our pronouns. And the teacher says, but you can pass on the pronoun if you want. A few people passed, a few didn't. Then finally at the end, I'm assuming at the end of meditation, we did a compassion meditation thing. And then she asked us to go around and say who we would like to dedicate the day's practice to. I heard everything from the people of Gaza to Mother Nature. When it came to me, I passed. I've been thinking about what made me uncomfortable because I wouldn't be terribly offended by any of this stuff in another context, but it felt struggle session-y to me. Like, what if somebody had said, quote, I pray for Donald Trump or Mitch McConnell or I pray that Israel defeats Gaza, or I pray for people who are being attacked by the homeless, or whatever. She says, what if somebody had said that? She says, the whole participatory nature of everything seemed like a way to establish an insider opinion and submission to it. You know what I mean? Am I ranting? Did I get transported to the San Fran Zen Center? Should we call Brad Warner? <laughs> Hope you're well. So, all right, <laughs> okay, let's talk. I thought for a long time about my friend's email, about what she was asking me and the story she told. And I studied and I sat with my reaction because it was so knee-jerk that I thought, you know what, buddy, maybe it's time to, to look, at, look at this a little bit. So, what are the conclusions that I came to? And this is just a preface to my real thoughts on the, on the letter. One of the conclusions that I came to is a conclusion that I have been coming to for a while now, which is, I'm like an old Gen Xer. And like Gen Xers, if I may present a stereotype of my generation, like I feel like we really don't like being put in categories and boxes and like sort of like soft, goody, goody, like progressive pressure to behave and act a certain way. It just kind of triggers something in us. I mean, I see this reaction again and again and again from Gen Xers. But I've learned in just for example, um, hanging out with my girlfriend's son, he's a generation Z, he's 19. My girlfriend's son and some of his friends, they're very intelligent. They're very soft, sort of soft-spoken, but like strong in spirit. And they have, they just have a different attitude about things. So a lot of like, I feel like what I before thought was kind of a strong point of view, I think it's just old man Gen X stuff. So when I read this um, email, 
like part of me just was like cringing and, and double cringing and then my cringing self cringed, right? Like, and I'm coming up with all these arguments in my head like, And then I'm thinking about, eh, in any event. But I calmed myself and I thought about rituals. And I thought about how what this sitting group is doing is a kind of ritual. And every meditation group contextualizes the silence of the practice, i.e. the meditation practice contextualizes that silence, that non-duality with certain rituals. So what I said to my friend here is, um, every meditation group begins and ends the sitting with rituals. Bowing, lighting incense, chanting, these are the traditional rituals. So the rituals that you have say something about the practice that you're doing. So, what the heck? Dippity do, bud. The rituals that you do say something about the practice that you're doing. So for example, when, when we were in the Zendo meditation hall, or when we are in the Zendo meditation hall, uh, every time you change your position and start a new practice, you bow. You're bowing to acknowledge that you're changing your position and you're starting a new practice. So it's a way of marking the moment and doing nothing unconsciously. Sloppily standing up, because you're gonna be thinking. You're gonna be thinking, right? We're always thinking, but if you have something to do, an activity to give your mind to and your attention to, it keeps you in the moment and out of your head because we always have a knee-jerk impulse to, to disappear inside our own thoughts. And the practice of Zen, as I learned it and hope to practice it now and in the future, is to get out of your head and into the situation into the world around you, where your inner world can come out as an expression of giving and connection with the outside world and vice versa. So it's very, rituals are really important, right? And so I said to my friend, I said this to her, I says, the rituals distinguish one tradition or lineage from another and provide context for the silence that you just shared. You can tell who you're sitting with by what they do in between the sits. The stuff that happens in between or before or after the silence is when non-dual spiritual practices start to shade into particular religions. Now, one thing that I said then was, the question I like to ask is, or think about is, or that I'm thinking about now is, are the rituals at least a nod to something bigger than or transcendent of the human world, as my teacher used to call it. You know, for example, when we used to do three great bows in the zendo to, to open the sitting, I was told the Jiki Jitsu is not bowing to the Buddha statue on the Butsudan altar. You are bowing to something bigger than, than anything you can conceive of and that holds all of us together. My teacher used to say, we share one cosmos, all of this difference in one cosmos, one universe. And that's what you're bowing to when you do your great bows in the meditation hall. So, so the point is, the rituals in Zen, uh, at least the one that I just mentioned, bowing to the, something that's bigger than yourself, it, that ritual puts differences in context, right? So it's not reinforcing differences, but it's putting differences between things and people within the phenomenal world in perspective. It's not reinforcing 
the differences between people and things within the phenomenal world. And I went on to say, eh, any ritual that doesn't put differences into context, but rather reinforces them, is a bullshit ritual. Now, that was my grumpy Gen X side coming out. I acknowledge it, um, but to some extent, I think it's true. I also think some people are gonna feel more comfortable in a setting that has land naming rituals and pronoun giving rituals and compassion practices, naming whom you're sitting for and uh, why you're sitting for them. Uh, some people are just going to feel more comfortable in these settings and they're going to go to a yoga studio and, part and be because it has these rituals. So when I thought about my friend's email in the context of rituals, outside of politics, outside of my grumpy Gen X point of view, when I just thought about it in terms of rituals, it kind of put a different spin on it for me. One thing that occurs to me is when you do these rituals, um, they're, not, they're not neutral. They have a political valence. So a land naming and a pronoun giving ritual before a sit within our North American cultural, social, political context that has a very progressive liberal valence. There's just no way around that. I always think about these things in terms of my conservative Catholic mother. Like, how would she view this? Well, to her, that would be some liberal crap, okay? Um, now, another thing that occurs to me is, this is, I, one, one, you create, when you have a strong position, you create your opposite in some sense. You, you, so to do a liberal progressive rituals before a meditation sit, I feel like just as a matter of course on planet Earth, like somewhere, there's some guy in a MAGA hat at a Trump rally that's like, I'm going to start a sitting group for conservative, anti-woke, intellectual, dark web Republicans. Like, it's just like, you just create this thing. Like, it's your doppelganger. And that's to be considered if you bring a political valence, a strong political valence into a sitting group. I mean, when I was young, I was raised conservative Catholic, and I never stopped hearing about how abortion is murder and abortion is a sin. So it was a political issue that was uh, religified or a, 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 a religious issue that was politicized within conservative Catholicism. We can imagine a situation where we've got a new type of right-wing Buddhism in supported even by, say, somebody like the Dalai Lama, who has gone on the record in the past for uh, being against abortion. And then I believe he walked those comments back. But you can look at Buddhist principles and draw different conclusions than those of a progressive liberal. These are some things to consider, right? When we, when we bring a certain political valence into our meditation practices. Again, the, the rituals that we do to contextualize the silence are, are very important. When you sit in silence, it's, it's, um, the mind is engaging with this simple activity of meditation and your attention is going into your body and into your surroundings and it's also a light is turned on inward and you can see your biases floating up and through the attention that is paid to those biases and those thoughts, they just kind of dissolve, they pass. And this glow 
of awareness uh, manifests and the self dissolves. The differences dissolve. This is a kind of a break from the grit and the blood and the filthy lucre and the power struggles, the commodification, the everything that we associate with human society and life on planet Earth and suffering, right? And when you come back from your sit, I find you're a little bit more open, I am, and a little bit more effective. And I can listen to people. Mostly, I have found when I do this practice of becoming intimate with myself and my surroundings through Zazen, when I come back, I am more compassionate and my thinking is sharper. But I'm less of an asshole. Okay, I'm less of a jerk to people who don't agree with me and who have different political points of view. And whether it's the crazy, uh, I call them that. So I have made my pitch here today, hopefully for silence. However you get there, whatever context you use to frame it, the point is, the point is dissolving of the ego and the self and one's identity through this giving completely of one's attention to <sighs> Zazen, meditation. Hope that was helpful. If you want to support this channel, you can go to my Patreon link right here. We've got a great community there, got essays up there, and at some point I'm going to be posting chapters from my newly completed novel, baby, yeah, at some point. So come on over there to Patreon if you want to support this channel. You can also do a one-time donation through PayPal. A link is in the video description below. Hit the subscribe, hit the like, help the algorithm elves grab this channel and sprinkle it into people's computers so that you and I can thrive and our meditation will live and we'll take over the internet and we'll start a new cult of Zen Confidential and then we will not have so much coffee in the morning anymore. Thank you. Good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs>